because we are learning this, we care because on the test. Okay. But what, what's sort of what's the benefit of chemical bonding? How does it how is it related to our lives? How is it related to the world? There's more stuff that produces longer chains, maybe. Okay. We can make different types of molecules. Yeah, basically, I mean, we've got all kinds of different elements on our periodic table, right? But chemical bonding allows these elements to, to join with each other and make more complex structures, right? And it's those complex structures that we make in the chemical world, sort of in the in the molecular world, that allows us to, to really move beyond things like rocks and minerals, right? Where where they're very simple, they're just small things stuck together, and it allows us to get the complex right? So that's the whole idea. So what's the difference between ionic and covalent bonding? Anybody? Difference between ionic and covalent? Um, ionic includes a positive or negative charge, and covalent is the sharing of electrons. Okay, so in ionic bonding we're looking at... Whoa. We're looking at certain things taking electrons from one from another, right? And then what that ends up um, sort of resulting in are different charges. Ionic bonding. So we said we have taking of electrons. And then we have different charges interacting. And what type of atoms do we usually see ionic bonding happening between? Okay, yes. <laughs> what on the periodic table, what type of what type of metals and non-metals. Yeah, these guys are metals and non-metals. So who takes the electrons? Non-metals. Non-metals, yeah, non-metals. Right. Which makes the non-metals positive or negative? Positive. Well, positive. I'm hearing a lot of back and forth here. I'm even hearing people switch, change their mind. The non-metals take the electrons and therefore they become negative. Right? Because they're adding more electrons to their to their valence chain. Right? So non-metals become negative. Metals therefore become positive. And what about uh, covalent bonds? We said a segment ago there that they're sharing electrons, covalent bonding. Here we have the sharing of electrons. Okay. So do we get charges or no charges? We have no charges going on in covalent bonds, no charges. What type of uh, atoms or elements do we see involved in these guys? Everybody know my shorthand here? Between, yeah, between, between non-metals. Okay. No charges involved. We've got non-metals. They share their electrons. And what's the purpose of them sharing their electrons? What are they trying to do? What's everybody trying to do? Yeah, everybody's trying to fill valence shells, right? And what is a valence shell? The outer outer energy level, right? The outer electron. Basic ideas going on here. We have a look at a couple of different, a couple of different elements. So if you have your periodic table, if we're looking at um, something like sodium, what is it that we need to know about this? What's the information that we want to know from this in order to help us with bonding? We want to know the number of electrons in the outer shell. So we want to know the number of valence electrons. Okay. What else do we want to know about? If it's 
metal or non metal? If it's metal or non metal. And usually, right, we can tell that by knowing whether we have what number of uh, valence electrons we have, right? If we have a few valence electrons, right, less, sort of, more or less, we're looking at metals. And if we have four or more, usually we're looking at non metals, as far as we're concerned, as far as we went down the periodic table. So we have a look at our periodic table, and we find out that it has. It's not negative one yet. And we just want, you said we want to know how many valence electrons it has. How, so how many valence electrons does it have? It has one. How do we know that? Because it's in the what? It's in the first column, right? We have a look. Do you remember what we call those? We called the columns something, and then we called the rows something else. Which one was groups? The rows or the columns? One was, one was groups and one was uh, periods. Groups this way? Periods this way. Yeah. That's it. Right? So the group is the column that we're in. So what we want to know for valence electrons is we want to know what group the element is in. Okay? And that's where we look across the top and one, two, three, four, and then we jump all those ones in the middle. Right? And we come out the other end and it's like 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, but we only really care about the four, five, six, seven. Okay? So this guy you said we're in group one. So we know it has one valence electron. We also know that it is a It's a metal. Yeah, that's okay. That's what the periodic table is there for, so you can look at it, right? So we know that this guy's a metal, so we know what type of bonding is, is sodium going to be involved in. Yeah, so we look at sodium, we find sodium on the periodic table, right? When we find sodium on the periodic table, we look to see what group it's in. We look to see what column on the periodic table it's in. Right? Once we identify what column it's in, we know that that's the number of valence electrons that it has in its valence shell, in its outer energy level for electrons. Right? So we see sodium when we look at the periodic table, and we see that it's in the first group. We see it's in the first column. Right? And because it's in the first column, we know that it has one valence electron. Right? And we also have a look there. We know that the, when we're looking at the periodic table, the left side is where all the metals are. Right? The left side is where all the metals are. And then the right side over in that far right corner is where the non metals are. Right? And there might be different colors, like on ours back here, right on your periodic table, it might tell you. You might not, though, have these colors on a test because it might be photocopied in black and white. Right? But it'll tell us here what types of elements these things are. But generally speaking, only this corner are the non metals. Everything else are some type of metal. Okay. And really, the only ones that we deal with are over here, right? Because we're skipping all these guys in the middle. We don't talk about them. The only metal that's on the other side is aluminum that's over here. It's the only one that we might look at. And usually I'll avoid it just because it can be confusing. Right? So I'll use these guys over here just to keep it simple. Metals on this side, non-metals over here. Is that all right with everybody? So, Mr. Matthews, yep. what's, uh, which is Colin, and what's the another one, row? The rows are called periods, which is why we call it the periodic table. So sodium, you told me we got one valence electron. We got, we know now that it's a metal, so we know what type of bonding sodium is going to be involved in. It's going to be involved in ionic bonding. And since it's a metal, is it going to gain or lose electrons? It's going to lose electrons. How many is it going to lose? Easy. Right? So if we find something else, we pick one maybe on the other side. Let's take uh, fluorine. If we look at fluorine, what's the situation there? We got seven valence electrons. So remember, we just go around the outside. One, two, three, four, and then we start to double up. Five, six, seven. Right, so that we pair them up. And then what is it that we're looking for here? What's going on? Yeah, fluorine wants to steal an electron away from sodium. Why does fluorine want to steal an electron? Because it's a non-metal, right? It's a non-metal. So these guys are trying to give up electrons, right? We said metals are going to become positive. They do that by losing electrons. Non-metals are trying to fill up their valence electron by stealing electrons from something else, right? It's a lot easier. Remember, they're always trying to get to, what's the number they're trying to fill up to? Eight. Eight, right? So they're trying to get either seven more here or just lose one. Because when they lose one, remember, they drop down to that energy level on the inside. 
right? When, did everybody remember that? You want me to draw that on the board or draw it or don't draw it? Draw it. Draw it. Yeah. We'll do it quick. Okay. Sodium. Sodium. We know that it's in its first energy level. How many electrons? Two. Two. One for hydrogen. One for helium. Right. And the next energy level. How many we got there? We got eight. Right. We start going across for all those different eight elements that we count across the periodic table. Okay, and then we go into our next energy level because that one's full. And that's where we realize that we have one more and we're done, right? Sodium 11 electrons altogether. Right? So if sodium loses this guy in the inside, then it ends up going. <laughs> if, it, if it loses that one, then it ends up going back down to the next energy level, right? That energy level is not needed since there's no electrons there. So it drops back down to a full energy level. But what happens to sodium once we've done this? It becomes plus one, right? Because it's lost an electron. Right? And what's going to happen with fluorine? It's being minus one, right? So it's reached over and it's grabbed onto sodium's electron and taken it, right? So fluorine ends up having a full shell. And what happens to it then as far as charge is concerned? Fluorine becomes negative one. And are they happy? Yes. Why are they happy? Yeah, this guy's got a full valence shell, this guy's got a full valence shell. Do we need any extra fluorines or sodiums to balance everything out? No. Easy, easy. Right? So not only are we trying to fill our valence shell, but what else are we trying to do? We're trying to balance the what? The charge, the overall charge. So we want everybody's valence shells to be full, but we also want the charge, the overall charge, to be neutral as well. Everything always starts out neutral. Everything on the periodic table starts neutral. But it's only when they start interacting with each other that they start stealing electrons from one another, and that changes the balance overall. So that's why they bind back together to help balance, balance themselves out. How can you figure out, like, the, um, like, I guess the first two parts, but then the other, how do you have to work something out? In here? Yeah. Like, how did I know that there were two here and there were eight here? Yeah. That, can anybody help us with that one? How do we know, so when we drew sodium, how do we know that there were two electrons in the first energy level? It's, it's, uh, it's the, rule of, the rule of what? Oh. It's a periodic table. Yeah, can you, can you go over to the periodic table and, and show us, or maybe somebody else can help us out? How long are you standing up? Tanika's going to walk you through, you just got to be the pointer. And how do we know how many electrons are e in each shell? The group. The shell has two and then all the way. Like, like on a full shell, like on a full shell, the first one only has two electrons. And how do we know that looking at the periodic table? Yeah, because there's two elements in the first in the first row, right? In the first period. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'll, I'll work. Thanks, man. You guys know you guys don't know who Dan White is, do you? You guys know that show uh, Wheel of Fortune? Or you, you've probably never seen the show, but maybe you've seen it as a game. Vanna White was the lady that like went across and she turned the letters and never mind anyway. Um, thank you. So if, when we look at the first K, okay, these are the groups we said, and the groups tell us how many valence electrons are in each or are on each element. The periods though tell us how many energy levels they have. So like Tanika was saying, the first the elements in the first period have one valence, or sorry, one energy level. The elements in the second period have two energy levels, right? The elements in the third, three, the elements in the fourth, they have four energy levels, so they have four rings uh, around the outside of them. How do we know how many electrons are in each? We just count across. The first one, one, two. It has two electrons. That's why the periodic table has the shape that it has. How about the second one? The second one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, oh. eight. That's eight. Third one? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Fourth one, fourth one starts getting funky, but for us, we go one, two, put the brakes on and we stop. But in reality, then we start going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, we start backfilling into the third row. 
you'll learn about that next week. It's actually not that hard. It's really kind of neat. But point being, that's why we stop there. Just keep it simple, as, as simple as we can for what we're talking about. We don't need to look at that stuff yet. Lots of chairs. Only grab a chair on that. Just is that making a little bit of sense? Right? So use the periodic table, right? Don't memorize it, learn how to read it. It's a book, it has information in it. It's not a book, you don't have to flip pages, right? But it's got lots of different details that can help you understand what's going on. Okay? Just got about five minutes left here. So we got ionic bonding here. These guys are bonded together then. Right? Because that plus one charge and that negative one charge are drawing them together. Questions about ionic bonding? What would happen if this guy happened to be, say, for example, magnesium? What would change if this, instead of being sodium, was magnesium? It would have two. It would have two valence electrons. So then what would that happen if we all of a sudden have it interacting with fluorine? Fluorine would take one. Yeah, fluorine would take one, and then magnesium would be, would still have another one, would need another fluorine. Right? Because magnesium would have two valence electrons. Do you want me to draw that one down? It's all right? Okay. You can imagine, right, if this guy had two now, if it was magnesium, it would have two valence electrons. So the first fluorine would steal one, and then magnesium would be like, hey, what, what, what about my other one? I'm not, I'm not happy yet. Somebody got to take my other one. So another fluorine would have to come into the rescue and take that. So then we'd have magnesium, and what would its charge be? It'd be plus two, right? And then we'd have fluorine, and it would be minus one still. But we need to... Yeah, we need two of them, right? So that's where you would, and you draw a little two down there to show that you have one of these and two of those. You mean like, does is it supposed to be plus one or one plus? It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really. You'll see it written both ways depending on which. There might actually be a standard convention, but nobody really pays attention to it. Yeah. Do we need to write the charge? What do you mean you need to write it? Do we need to write the charge? Um, no. No. But sometimes, though, I'll say this one, right? So Alfonso was asking. Do you need to write the charge? Like, do you need to write this and this? Usually it depends. Look at the number of marks that the question's worth. If it's worth one mark, no. If it's worth more than one mark and it says, show your work, yes. You know what I mean? Like, if it's worth three marks, then maybe I want to see this. Maybe I want to see this. Maybe I want to see then this at the end. Right, but you can tell by the number of marks. It's only worth, worth one mark to show me the final answer. Yeah? Do an example of covalent bonding. So what's going on with covalent bonding? Yeah. They're sharing electrons. So we'll start with our favorite one, carbon, right? You see, you see carbon all the time, carbon all the time, because it's got four valence electrons, right? So again, we just go around before we start pairing things up, and we end up with one on all sides, right? Carbon, super, super, super important for life because of the fact that it can bond with up to four things, or it can make single, double, or triple bonds, right? In theory, it can make quadruple bonds, but in reality, it doesn't really happen in nature. Um, so we don't, you won't see that very much. Uh, at all. But anyways, carbon, what are we going to stick it to? Hydrogen. hydrogen. Sure. How many hydrogens do you want to stick it to? You want to stick it to four hydrogens? Okay. Here's one hydrogen. It's got one valence electron. Remember, for us, as far as we're concerned, hydrogen is normally going to play in the covalent bond, even though it's way over on the metal side. For us, it's going to behave as a non-metal. It's a, it's a weird, freaky element, and it'll sometimes you'll learn more about that next year. Sometimes it behaves as a metal, sometimes as a non-metal. But usually we'll see it as a non or as a metal when it's um, in acid base reactions. We haven't talked about that stuff at all. So we got carbon, we got hydrogen. How do we show that these guys are being shared with each other? Sure, yeah, draw a circle around them. They're being shared. Or we could draw what? We can draw a line between them, yeah. So we can take that 
I'm just showing, using different colors just so it shows up. We can show that line joining them together. Either one's okay. But somehow show over here it's being taken, right? Maybe you want to draw an arrow and go, it's going over there. Or you draw the hand, that's taking it over here. Whatever you like. At the beginning of the year, we had this like, really complicated unit body thing. Yep. It's like four carbon, six hydrogen stuff. It's it's not it's not likely that that would be on the exam for one reason and one reason only. It's not that it's a difficult question. It just takes too long. I, I don't want you sitting there like spending half an hour trying to figure out the stupid combination where I can give you three or four different elements and you you can show me that you understand what's going on. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not that you can't do that one. There's just too many different possible combinations, so you end up mixing and matching all over the place, and that's just a waste of time. Right. So anyways, we got a bunch of hydrogens, and those are going to bind up with each other, right? Sharing the valence electrons. Okay. Until everybody's got a full valence shell. How many, how many electrons in hydrogen's valence shell? Just two, right? Just two, because it's in the first period. You only put two of them in there, right? So hydrogen's full, hydrogen's full, hydrogen's full, hydrogen's full. How many is carbon supposed to have? Eight, because it's down in the second period. Right, so we know it's supposed to have a two, four, six, eight because of the sharing that's going on. Carbon and hydrogen, everybody's happy, everybody's balanced, everything's good. Any questions? Well, what? Pulling on polar, I think we got on the on the schedule for tomorrow, don't we? Yeah. Or did I, I think I think I